What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Terminus, and today, uh, let me just put that over there so I don't um, bump the mic uh, because it's connected to the desk. Today, we are talking about Made in Abyss uh, episode 7. Made in Abyss 7. There's not a lot I do have to talk about. A little heads up I did change some of my setup. I do have a new light. Uh, tell me if it's too bright. I can turn it down a, a little bit in the next recording or in the one after, depending on uh, if I actually do record these two together, like seven and eight, or if I'm going to do them separately. It depends on how much time I have on my hands. But um, do let me know. Also, let me know if the, uh, if the sound is all right. I did have some problem with my Shingeki no Kyojin final uh, movie reaction where I had to do a lot of post-processing to actually get my um, the crackling sound in, in my microphone to get fixed. I think it was because the cable wasn't completely attached. That can happen at times. Anyway, that out of the way, I know not everybody does like me talking about recording specifics and, and um, and lighting and whatever from from the get-go also um, sorry <laughs> little heads up my camera is also slightly different do tell me if you prefer that angle or if you prefer the old one I do have a new stand I'm kind of trying to figure out uh, a good way to do that uh, and um, to to kind of um, get myself to the side of the picture uh, where I can just have a little bit more space to uh, uh, to articulate myself and also to 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 kind of be out of the frame for the picture and picture and whatever but yeah um that out of the way we did end last episode with the scythe uh the reveal that um ozen did actually find liza's uh liza's whistle and liza's scythe at this place um down in the um i don't even know which uh which layer it was it was i think the fourth or something i i don't know the name of the layer exactly it's oh yeah the tomb of, um, not not the tomb the tomb of giants is dark souls but um the goblet of giants exactly the goblet of giants because of like the giant um mushroom trees growing there which is a very interesting very cool sight to see um yeah, and we do find ourselves uh, in that situation um, that Rico kind of has to accept that Liza might be dead down there, but uh, we do have a reason to go on beyond that at this point, which is Reg and, and his quest of finding out who he is and where he came from. And also Rico does want to get that closure to know that Liza's dead for sure and also to, to know why or how she died. Um, and and who wrote that mysterious note down there and now we we stepped our way into the um, I'm gonna just leave the subs on here uh, normally for for discussion I do turn the subs off but uh, a great shot by the way this it, it's so insane this this reverse forest just the, the trees are even the trees aren't even growing the other way the trees are growing upwards I wonder if that is due to the strong winds that we saw um, when Rack was trying to grapple away there and <laughs> kind of, um, uh, yeah, uh, kind of couldn't do it because the winds are so strong and we do have all these avian creatures flying here. Um, yeah, we do step our way into Ozen's uh, quarters with some very interesting relics here, uh, including, uh, if I do remember correctly, yeah, right here, the scythe, uh, which... I was still kind of curious if it's Liza's scythe or if it's a scythe that uh, some or all of the members of Liza's kind of adventurer group uh, have or if scythes are actually a thing for white whistles in general and um, Liza maybe kind of might made, made this uh, practice of carrying a scythe big. Uh, I can imagine something like that for example and I can also imagine it have, having some kind of practicality to it. Um, we do make our way into that very clean room and I left on a mystery of uh, what the hell is this thing that we are staring at here, this weird dimensional cube um, or portal or uh, projection device or recording device, whatever it's going to be that is going to give us our next answers and probably some of our next goals going forward. 
and we do have those thoughts in the back of our head what what kind of relation did Liza have to um, Ozen um, I mean apparently Ozen helped her carry Rika out of the underworld out of out of the abyss into into Orth but the question here remains that if that was uh, done for a friend um, or if there was some animosity going on between the two or um, also maybe um, if that specific event kind of um, caused a fracture in their relationship with each other uh, or uh, rolled off um, caused some events happening down the line that kind of worsened their relationship or made them more distant um, and there's still the, the question of uh, feelings and whatnot. Were they friends? Uh, did Ozen have a closer connection to her or more of a far off connection with like being an associate or maybe just being um, a rival that she respected a lot? There is definitely something there because we saw her pondering on, on the whistle when she was uh, looking out. Um, while uh, Rico and uh, Rek were being shown around. We do still have Rex's identity, Rex seeing himself as a human and not, not clearly accepting him being a robot, um, just being in between somewhere there. Um, and I do question if that if that comes back around and Rex actually was a human that was modified or... Or if there's some other existential <laughs> questions coming up uh, with that later on. And we do have some little insight on the relics and... Um, we, we do also meet Marok um, as a very interesting character that apparently Ozen cares about very much, uh, which in turn humanizes Ozen in a way and makes her appear less monstrous, uh, less inhuman and more like somebody we can to a degree at least try to understand. But yeah, that's about the, the extent of what I actually wanted to look at for the most part. The only thing that's left for, for me, for us, now is to look into the future and, and look how uh, how all of this is going to pan out, right? Because uh, on, on a very basic level, this is just us um, being in Rico's shoes and experiencing it alongside her and, and starting to making this, these discoveries. So I can't wait to see what's, uh, what this episode has in store for us. How far are we going to go? Are we going to go into a deep like flashback or lore dump kind of situation? The series so far it has handled its lore dumps very well. Um, we do have the, the typical trope of, hey, I'm going to explain these things over and over again to you despite the fact that most of the characters should know these things. Uh, we do have the ambiguity of the abyss where a lot of information is either secret or uh, not quite clear or just being relayed. Um, so we do have that ambiguity that kind of makes it believable. And we do have the character of our uh, main protagonist, Rico, who, who is very excited to tell everybody uh, about the things she discovered and about the things that happen in the abyss because she's very passionate about the abyss and very interested in it and it's her whole world so she keeps telling it over and over so it makes it more believable as well but yeah uh, i wonder if we're going into a lore dump or if we're just having a short period where we find out something intriguing that kind of pushes on us onward and gives us more of a reason to go down further into the abyss we do have this effect of yeah, if you go back up, we saw that uh, the last couple of episodes, uh, every time Rico went up, even even small distance, you did see it has a heavy impact on her. So the question is, do we at some point actually have to um, abandon our route and tread back to, to a previous area, like for example, this seeker camp here, and then um, get into the situation that this is having a heavy toll on us or... Uh, having some leaving some damage either temporary or permanent on us um, that is a very interesting question as well because it kind of propels us forward and, and, and cuts our way to the surface not completely off but it, it makes it far more difficult to say I'm, I'm going to turn back here and I'm going to be careful and that in my opinion just perpetuates the, the attitude of Rico who is just constantly going forward but yeah, do we have more, will we get more of a reason to go forward or will we have reasons to start doubting specific things or start being more careful down the line? That is definitely something. And I do wonder 
if Lila is actually dead or not, or if there's more to it that we do not know, right? Like, her in some way, I mean, we did hear stuff like about uh, losing humanity and whatnot. And we did see various strange creatures down the line. We did see that Ozen herself kind of is maybe still human in a lot of ways, but also very strange and very, um, yeah. And she talks about how if you're isolated and you, um, and you spend a lot of time on your own that you are getting kind of refined, uh, uh, kind of using that metaphor of, uh, how it's, uh, how it affects your character, how it um, imprints on your character. And I do wonder if this is something that's going to come up as well. So, yeah. I'm going to make quick cuts. You know the deal uh, by now, probably, if you've seen the, the previous episodes and everything. And we're going to come back and just start the episode. All right. Uh, ladies and gents, I'm back uh, with our reaction to uh, Made in Abyss episode seven let's go in a right, get that back to zero a three a two a one Bam. in you may okay that's a very interesting uh cold open <laughs> and we go into the intro of course we do human sets become one with their convictions that's a very interesting conceptual thing right stopped rushing forward so they don't have a goal but they have convictions so they only live for their convictions so i do wonder what they're they have any purpose of just stray around or just stay in one place and if if so um who's she talking about right is she talking about herself or liza or Maybe she's alluding to what uh, Rico could become if she doesn't keep moving. Like the abyss seems to be a very interesting conceptual space as well, right? Where thoughts and and ideas can kind of also merge into something new, something interesting, something physical, right? The thought of thoughts um, and ideas having a physical manifestation can be very interesting. The longing will never again cease. Will we just keep climbing down? And what what awaits us? Is it just endless? Oh, that was the robot. Oh, so the scythe might be a relic. It looks like a headless skeleton. You know what, like like a headless right or whatever. You hear enough rumors, you start to believe there's there's some truth to it. So she isn't as she's older than she seems. Oh, okay, very interesting. So they might know about Lysa's relic, but... He doesn't trust her completely, but he doesn't trust her because she's unpredictable, as we, we have kind of assumed. But yeah, that head is a very interesting head. Kind of reminds me of some like the Bloodborne outfits that you can see. Holy shit, this is a pink cube reference. Oh, and her she reacts to a whistle kind of. Very interesting. Oh that yeah, that is the thing. Right, so what's the truth? Hmm, okay. But why did Rico not die then? Wait, 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 so Rico might not be human. <sighs> Holy shit. She's a relic herself, kind of. Oh, that was it. She's crazy. Like, she's... she's... <laughs> Oh, she has a dark side. 
なぜかアビスの中心に向かおうとしたんだよね。Oh, way that compels them? 気にしてるんじゃないかな。君もあの肉と同じなんだろう。Oh, dehumanizing her. That must be really hard on her. Okay. She is. Do tell me. The abyss has an object of worship. Interesting. He's powerful. She has some personal grudges here. How are they gonna get out of this? Are we gonna get Wreck X Machina or is Rico gonna do something? Now we do see the real side of White Whistles. Her glasses are off. She's. Where are you holding back? That's the... oh the beam, the beam. How much does she know about Reg? Control, control. But is she gonna leave you the time? Ooh, can he stop it? Somebody tell me what that means, like it, like how it's written in in kanji, because I'm very interested. I haven't heard that before. Oh. Yeah. Maybe some kind of relic. She cast off a part of her humanity as well. Oh, okay, and now we see it. The immovable. I like I like the designs very blocky, like some kind of like automaton or some. I mean, he's right. She she calls him inhuman, but at the same time, she does see him and look very inhuman. Or is he gonna remember something? What's her goal here? I mean, I don't suppose she's trying to test them. This is actual resentment here. Oh, okay. 
Oh no, wait, wait, what? Where are we? What, what was... What's happening? Who are these people? Responsibility. It's not your fault, man. It's not your fault. Did they stop her? So she has a squad, she, she does all human relations. I mean, she, she has Meryl, we know that. She wanted, so she wanted to test them. Very cruel, to be honest. Olsen, you have some very uh, questionable tendencies. I, I'm sure they are. Seat beds, um, yeah, that, that makes me very uncomfortable, that, that thought. That's what I was asking myself. And she believes it too, okay. So it was all the deception. I mean, she fooled me, okay? She fooled me. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. And now we go for the flashback, for the memories. Oh, and this is their relationship. She used to be a child when she was, was already grown up and all of that. Again, we do have this. We do have this interesting thought about mental and uh, mental constructs uh, showing themselves physically. The same attitude, right? I wonder what's really going on inside her head. But we, I mean, we do, we do see warmth here. We do see um, sympathy. But we also see that, to a degree, people lose a part of their humanity the further they go and the longer they stay there. I wonder if Liza one day surpassed Ozen. And we are at the point now that Ozen is. The old master, basically, and Liza is the new master, more or less. <laughs> Your choices are kind of concerning, Ozen. Our first practical lesson by White Whistle. I mean, technically, Rico. Rico should be really happy that this is happening, though. All things considered, like the way Ozen played with them and, and kind of tested them was brutal, so I do understand that her enthusiasm is a little bit tempered at this point. Actual survival training. So that part was true. Ah, yep. The energy gets strained. She would be vulnerable in that time. Yeah, no, no time for hesitation in that one. Hesitate and die. <laughs> Sekiro. Uh, if anybody has played that one. And that's it, our challenge, right?
So it's very interesting. Um, uh, all right. We do have our deception that, again, that fooled me. So very interesting, very cool. Wonder when we're gonna meet her. Looks like it's still one of the upper layers, so. This could be one of like the mushroom trees. And then we go into the deep chasm. And we see all the relics that that we've already seen. We haven't seen an umbrella yet. Very interesting. Like it looks looks like some kind of like stone shield umbrella. So the part about her being dead and being revived and the things that are in there being drawn down to the abyss are actually true. So something to think about, right? Um, hey, uh, what's going on? We are back uh, with our discussion. We have a little bit something to discuss. It's not that much, to be honest. So uh, we're going to get right into it and um, see how we go. Uh, I find it very interesting that Ozen mentions fear and the unknown um, connected to the Abyss and that the Abyss kind of is more or less a replacement for... Uh, a religion if you want, right? People around here don't believe in God. Apparently up on the surface they do believe in God. They they do kind of uh, have that faith going on. Um, but um, down here they believe in the abyss because the abyss is something mysterious. This is something people don't understand. But it is also something that provides, right? Like we, we, we've heard in the first or second episode where we get the narrative intro of like the Abyss provides all curse and fortune and um, or curse and blessing and uh, fortunes and treasures and on the other hand you have threats and, and death and and misery um, for those who challenge it and those who challenge it revere it as, as some kind of almost deity and it, this opens our way for a lot of interesting concepts here especially in combination with what Ozen later said um, Let's uh, just jump a little bit into the episode, scroll through. But before that, I'm I'm actually gonna um, I'm actually gonna talk about what Ozen said in in terms of like the abyss, more or less um, having the the curses of the abyss not just having an effect on your mind, uh, but if you're driven to near insanity, they this leaves marks on your actual body on the surface of your head on especially your head right so uh we have this very interesting concept that also connects to a few other things that that she says in the beginning where she talks about the um the creatures that are um coming out of the abyss uh that uh yeah um that they um they at some point stop stop moving towards a goal right uh and then they they start merging with their um i don't know what it was i think it was ideals or something like they're um these beings who while human also transcended humanity um they um watch over everything with the gaze of inhuman eyes and i wonder if she partially describes herself she's she herself is not one of these beings entirely but she is definitely close to being one of those beings uh, and uh, uh, yeah, um, we do find a little bit lore about um, about the white whistles, which all carry relics that they themselves unearthed. And Ozen the Immovable is not different here. And you normally don't talk about these relics because these are secret, right? Because the the, the white whistles are the secret weapon of the the entire guild. So if there's ever an emergency or if there's something they need them to do, um, it's important that probably um competing uh 
companies or illegal, like right from the wharf and whatnot, illegal people are not um, able to identify the relics that these people carry. So they they need to tread more carefully because they don't know what the capabilities of these people really are. Um, I find it really cool that we do see uh, that we do see Uncle Habo, that we do see Nat, that we do see Shigi, and and them kind of connecting over the fact that Rico is now going down there. I mean, they probably visited him before because he's a very um, he's very involved in community and is going up very often. Um, even though he is a black whistle and can go pretty pretty far down, um, but. Uh, it's very cool that they kind of talk to each other and this is one of the ways we, we get more exposition about the things that are also happening down there for us uh, specifically. Um, and Uncle Habo kind of worries about Ozen. Ozen tells us about the curse repelling vessel and the origins of Rico, which absolutely shocks her and it would shock me too, right? Like if somebody told me I'm something inhuman. That that is really that is a shocker in and of, of itself, right? Uh, but even that, I mean, the implications of that—that that you you put something dead inside or something that recently died, and then it gets woken up, uh, and you get to a point where you are um, where you're trying to that being tries to to head down into the abyss and is drawn to it. So there's the question: What's down there that's drawing it to it, right? What what is this magic? The curse? The the, 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 the invisible unknown forces that we do not understand yet, but pretty sure we're gonna understand them sometime down the line, uh, even if it's at the very end of the of the very end of the uh, original source material and whatnot. But what is this that draws us down? And could Rico in this case could she even be defined as human? And maybe also, what what good does it do for her? Right? What what? What doors does it open narratively that we can later make use of um, to, to for Rico to unlock new uh, capabilities and possibilities, uh, have resistances or whatnot? I mean, Rico had that idea, jumped to the conclusion, and uh, well, I was born down in the abyss. I must be kind of resistant to it, but she's not. We we seen that in multiple occasions and ha have heard that being um, uh, said by leader. By the way, I did read leader's name i just forgot it again so um, maybe it comes up at some point would be cool to see him again to see how he is doing but yeah um very interesting conceptually that she is not just conceived down there but she's also inhuman and that was apparently the truth the ozen makes herself out to be the villain here and makes herself out to be um i guess in a way this is actually a good challenge for them right because um we are getting to a position where um, she is emotionally attacking them, where she's mentally, mentally emotionally attacking them. Uh, she is wavering and questioning their convictions. She is trying to unsettle them. She's trying to make them give up on their purposes and goals. She's trying to um, prod. Uh, she's trying to physically hurt them and torment them. Um, now I do believe that later we see that she was she was like I was just getting too much into it. I'm sorry about that, but you do see she has these capabilities, right? She has these proclivities. There's a little bit of sadism in there, a little bit of inhumanity, right? Um, but she apparently there is some good thought behind it, and once we clear that up, uh, even though I'm pretty sure the uh, our two main protagonists, Rico and Rek, would still have an uneasy feeling about talking to and, and going with Ozen, but um, but uh, once we know that, actually, we, we we pull that curtain back of her being a monster and, and pull her back into into the side of humanity, kind of leaving her on that, uh, on the edge of the sword, basically, doing that balancing act and showing that the white whistles are, yes, they're humans like us. Uh, and yes, they have their own eccentricities, um, like every human does, uh, but they also sometimes maybe those eccentricities, those personality traits, all the things that that m maybe have been inherent from the beginning, uh, from from them growing up, um, they're getting reinforced and refined and and uh, possibly uh, intensified as they go down into the abyss and spend time not only alone and in isolation which probably 
for us normal humans as well, it reinforces our bad habits as well because we don't interact with anybody, we don't get our feedback. Um, we're always caught up in our own head and whatever, but um, also because um, because the effect the abyss ha has on your mind. Um, yeah, um, which um, brings us on. We do have this uh, sequence of heart-wrenching uh, Maruk uh, standing up for them, which apparently was the one thing that kind of uh, caught Ozen and, and brought her back in, into our um, into the present, more or less, and make her realize that maybe she was going too far, which is very interesting. Maybe. I wonder if she keeps Maruk around because of that, because she noticed that Maruk has this capacity to, to, to awaken in her, like, um, make her realize when she's going too far, when she's Right, this having this human element with you. I mean, I mean, she's been down there in the abyss for a long time as well, but not in the same capacity and fashion. Probably not the same depth as the White Whistle. So it's good to have some group of people around you. And we do find out later that she does have her cave raiders as well, which are going with her and which are kind of reminding her constantly of like, hey, you're kind of a little bit crazy. Uh, but yeah. Uh, uh, she does also share, show us our limits, right? The, the the limits of our capabilities. We haven't seen that yet. Most of the situations we were in so far, Rek was able to save us. Rek was our our uh, Deus Rek <laughs> Machina, basically. Um, yeah, and uh, we do see suddenly. Okay, Ozen has all of these. That that is insane, by the way. It's stitching that into your how how insane how 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 mentally unhinged how. <laughs> how driven uh, and eccentric and and in a way maybe also inhuman must you be to to put all of these unholy relics into your body but yeah she shows that there are things down there creatures uh, people right possible cave raiders as well who on a fundamental level are modified right they are modified by the abyss changed by the abyss and uh, do get into that uh, <laughs> into that uh, realization that ultimately there's things down there that just like Reg, because we do hypothesize Reg comes from down there, that there's people or or creatures down there just like Reg who are changed by the abyss, who are enhanced and modified by the abyss. Who not only have curses but also blessings in a way um as i've said before curses or blessings it depends on the perspective right obviously if you have bad eyesight or if you get headaches in specific situations that might be a curse but what if there's something else that change within you that that you can use or maybe you can use the relics that are down there to enhance yourself and now it's been worth it right it's been a trade-off you lost one capability or or have one um unfortunate side effect for whatever you're using to enhance yourself this is for example a discussion when it comes to professional bodybuilding all those steroids that people take uh, or even just beyond the steroids if you look at strongmen uh, the amount of calories they have to get in like 10,000 calories uh for one day um com in comparison like a normal human male human being uh in their 20s or 30s they they have a general um daily consumption of around 2000 calories that is like five times as much and that can't be good for all of your systems right be like your digestion your your metabolism in general it has to work over time and it has to constantly work that same goes for for your pancreas for for your um for your kidneys and and liver in 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 um, depoisoning right in 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 um, metabolizing these these things and 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 separating and filtering out the bad stuff uh, and or changing it into the good stuff uh, and it, that takes well, and also the the the, the effect that the, the the activity itself strongman activity for example does have on your like the competitions what does that have effect does it have on your nervous system the same for bodybuilding they they dehydrate themselves for two or three days that's not healthy and um but they have a goal right they have uh in in their mind they have a certain calling they they believe in something they want to achieve something they want to do something that nobody has done before or something that is 
very special that leaves them <laughs> in the history books or that has them stand out in some way that is one of the most basic human desires right but it is a it is a desire it is a strong goal and they want to achieve that goal and for that they they uh, um they sacrifice their their health in part because um shocker people who are going at the extreme end of bodybuilding at the extreme end of um of uh, physical performance are also not necessarily more healthy than people who are just doing the occasional sports twice or, or thrice a week to to stay healthy maybe the other ones are healthier because you are under extreme stress and under extreme pressure not only mentally but also physically uh, um, we do know for example that runner like long long range runners that that run marathons and whatnot they um after they run their mar marathon their immune system takes a, a very very big hit uh, and takes some time before they before they recover again right and all of these things are are detriments are disadvantages that these people um that these people accept uh in exchange for um reaching their goals right in exchange for doing something grand and i do assume that for the cave raiders it it might be a, a similar philosophy right you go in there and then other things take effect that also reinforce these these habits and these um these ways of thinking like for example sunk cost fallacy at some point you you invested 10 years into something and then you're here and you're like okay i I love doing that. I I have I still have my goals. I have further goals maybe that that I want to reach now, now that I'm capable of more. And uh, I've invested so much. I'll keep going, right? And it, maybe it will be the same for Rico and Reg as we go deeper into the abyss. We've already come so far, and the way back is so difficult, with with all the the the, the diving sickness or, or the curse of the abyss and whatnot. So um going further and further down is more or less incentivized uh, subconsciously and we are in the situation where we've already invested so much we've abandoned so much we've abandoned our friends we we've braved the dangers um and we just have to keep going right uh, and ozen is testing their resolve here also ozen is testing what happens if, if they're out of their depth what happens if there's somebody or something right um that uh, is stronger than them that is more clever than them and uh, they kind of failed the test but that's good because now she knows she has to train them she has to teach them to to real and she already started training them with that very specific thing she was doing here with with um beating rack and uh, i mean it's cruel right uh, that that is violence against somebody who is, who is very young a child who, who doesn't know shit um and being emotionally cruel and and there's certainly better ways to do so but in her in her mind this is the way to do it because um it's a harsh reality down in the abyss and they uh they've already taken that first step and if they go any further and they they meet people who are mo more capable than ozen more cruel than ozen more um malicious than ozen uh, or creatures that are um that are as clever as humans and and, and show that same level of malice or or um are predators uh, and and want to eat them then in the end they're gonna lose right they're gonna they're gonna over overestimate themselves they're gonna think they they get out of this situation and then they they make a mistake and she wants to um prevent that so by doing this uh in a way maybe not the perfect way like, i i can't say that as a psychologist i i think <laughs> this is highly questionable but at the same time i have to say in a way this specific instance of them meeting Ozen and and Ozen doing all these things to them has already made them realize that there might be situations in which they have to admit that the that the situation is too dangerous for them that they have to be careful that they have to find another way than direct confrontation or uh that they can't get caught at by any means right this is teaching them survival skills the hard way obviously but it's teaching them survival skills um one thing i am asking myself in this specific situation especially we do have the heart-wrenching scene of 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 um rico uh if, if rec dies she doesn't want to go on which already shows us how how strong their bond really is but um after this entire scene her being stopped and whatever and rec blaming himself in my opinion that's 
that's not on you, Rack. Um, that's on the both of you and the way you went down there and whatever. Um, and it's been a bit hasty, obviously. But um, after seeing all of that, I do wonder if uh, Rico and, and hearing what would what her origins are, if she will unlock some kind of power at some point, or at least capabilities, because I do believe it is, obviously we can tell a lot of stories with that, but it is very difficult if one part of the party is always the one who gets you out of a tricky situation. Obviously, like I said, you can tell a lot of stories with that. You can let uh, Rico develop along a more emotional um, and... Um, uh, and mental storyline, right? Uh, maturing as a person. Um, although I think Rack needs that too. But at the same time, I do believe you also have many limitations, right? I mean, while you can set the narrative in a way that it's very tension-filled and very dreadful every time that Rack is kind of out of commission or away or they get separated or whatever and Rico is on her own, that makes it very tense, that makes it very... Right, uh, that raises the stakes and and makes the the audience very anxious. But at the same time, how many times can you do that and then get saved by Rag again and then get saved by Rag again or by somebody else? How many times can you do that without kind of getting tired of it? I want to say. I mean, I trust the series to do it right, right? I trust the series to do it right. But I've had I've seen too many series in the past where it was. Uh, hey, that one person is very capable and the other person um, is not very capable. It's just on the level of like a normal in real life human being. And um, and we have that dynamic and the person here is developing as a character and the person here is developing also as a character, but also in terms of strength and capabilities. I do wish and I do hope that... Um, Rico will be able to grow into her own and follow in the footsteps of Liza, who can hold herself on her own. Um, maybe we can accomplish that through relics that Rico finds, but also I would hope that um, if we already have the setup of um, Rico's more or less inhuman origins, and if people already trust him to go down there, I hope that this is just a temporary phase where we do hope that Rack is protecting Rico um, from the really dangerous situations and that Rico is as clever as she is, she's very clever, um, can um, survive uh, until she is capable enough to actually brave some of these challenges on her own. That would be the ideal thing for me, in, in my opinion. But yeah, a very interesting episode. Um, we have deepening bonds, we have, um, we start to see relationships form also with Ozen and Liza. We see Ozen was already this grown up, already this old when Liza was still a child, which is insane, right? Uh, I mean, Rico is like 12 years old now. Liza is probably, I don't know, she was probably at least 20 when she got Rico, so we're in the 30s or 40s for Liza. So when Liza was little, Ozen was already this, right? And we do know that Ozen 50 years ago was already White Whistle. So I wonder how old is she really, right? And what is her story? Who who did she grow up with? Uh, uh, when did she go down the first time? And I wonder if Ozen is going to be a character that not just for now for the training, um, but also later might meet us again. And we do kind of interact with them and, and find out more. Uh, when we're ready, right? When we're ready as 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 people, as the story goes on and uh, yeah. But amazing that, that Liza here has the same attitude, the, the exact same attitude that Rico seems to show here. I wonder if Ozen actually despises uh, Rico or Liza in, in some way. Um, I don't think she does. I do think there is some resentment going on there though. I think it's some kind of like love hate hate relationship where you have like a lot of um uh warm feelings for somebody but at the same time there's that one thing about them that irks you and I do think that might be the case in 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 the case of Ozen and Liza and later in the case of Ozen and Rico because Rico is very much like her mother um which makes perfect sense right she's been looking up for her mother for all her life and people have been telling her about her mother I mean, she hasn't been able to, to be with her all that much, but she has heard a lot about her mother and it would follow suit that 
uh, some of her personality traits, especially if she gets treated similar to Liza because people see Liza in her. Um, a lot of um, her basic um, traits would come after her and, and kind of uh, be similar or the same. And we do see Liza turning into someone very capable. What I find very, very interesting, uh, that is an artistic choice that, that is incredibly interesting for me, is that we never seem to see Liza's eyes. We never see them. We always see them kind of like, I wonder what that means. I think in, in many anime and, and also in, 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 in normal shows, um, if we don't see the eyes of a character, we are kind of, it, it's kind of left open for us what kind of attitude that character has or what they feel in reality because eyes are co generally considered the windows to the soul and especially in anime eyes are displayed very big um very big windows very they're, they're they're used very often to express very uh specific feelings and moods and eccentricities and and personality traits um and a lot of artists put a lot of focus on the eyes and and also change the design of eyes very interestingly enough um between like from from anime to anime it's very different we do see eliza grinning all the time but we don't see how our eyes look and that is a very interesting element because yeah i know i look like a serial killer but but that's my point uh, i can i can smile with my mouth right i can be like the brightest most optimistic person ever but my eyes are very sad or or they're very angry or right we don't see the eyebrows we don't see the eyes we don't see the color of the eyes which is very interesting because oftentimes in art it represents some kind of idea behind it right uh, some idea some color um evokes a certain mood or emotional response in in the audience in the viewer and gives you an idea of who the character is supposed to be on a very basic artistic level um so again very iconic look for Liza, very similar to rico but i do wonder how the eyes look and why we're never seeing them if that is something that has to do with the cognition of the people who are remembering Liza, or if it is something that has to do with Liza being just a larger than life character in our story, which is told through mainly through the perspective of Rack himself and secondarily through Rico, although Rico never narrates, interestingly enough, um, at least so far. Um, or if this is an actual thing that the, the narrative is still trying to keep Liza very mysterious and trying to hide any semblance that we could gather from seeing her actual complete facial expression. Um, yeah, the, the inverted forest, very cool. We're going to the outskirts where nobody can help you, but also where probably uh, not the most dangerous creatures are. We, we, we saw that uh, in, I think, the last or the second to last episode where it was mentioned that the most dangerous creatures are in the middle. Um, there's the, the prime predators who are hunting out there and, and the biggest fish. Um, and Reg is forbidden of using his, his, his uh, little hand tool because it's a last minute, last kind of resort thing, right? He gets knocked out afterwards, he doesn't have enough energy, he sleeps for two hours and he's absolutely unable to wake up during that time. And that would leave Rico, who is the weaker one of the two at the moment at least incredibly vulnerable so probably gonna come up at some point um not right now i do think uh Rek is gonna heed that advice and it's gonna follow follow through and 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 they're gonna try to take this seriously and probably gonna succeed uh, although some some dangers and shenanigans will will most probably ensue and then and then later down the line, maybe two or three episodes down the line, or maybe half a core down the line, or maybe the second season even, we will have be in a situation where Rack uses his shit and, and passes out and wakes up and Rico is not there and he's like, holy shit, what did I do? Is she dead? What, what happened? And Rico is probably gonna have to prove herself in that moment. Um, but yeah, very interesting. The last thing I wanted to talk about um, as we scroll through the intro thoughts thoughts having material impact in the world of made in abyss a very very interesting thought right 
a very interesting idea. This uh, and very Lovecraftian, right? Uh, if you think Lovecraftian, you often think madman. You, you often think craziness and, and delusion and fever dream, and uh, you often think uh, reality being bent by the will of the old ones, uh, otherworldly beings, uh, and that is what we have here, right? Right? Uh, an otherworldly space, an unknown space to explore. That is very creepy and and crawly and and the laws of nature don't seem to completely apply here and seem to be twisted and turned so i do wonder how much of that is applicable right it, it opens the door for so many possibilities just the fact that you almost going insane leaves physical marks on your body at the specific point where the impact is right in 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 the case of going insane it's the brain and and that kind of right that kind of perpetuates this idea that that fantasy that that's often used in fiction where people can psionics right where people can influence m material things with their mind so i i do wonder if this is something that's going to come up if there's some people down the line who have these capabilities who can kind of telepathically or telekinetically um engage with the world or create things in the world that come from their mind from their imagination and i'm thinking of rico here not not in terms of she maybe having the capability though she might have but but uh, i'm thinking of rico because rico is a very imaginative person who, who who has a lot going on in her head that's maybe not always ground to reality that's maybe not always uh all that <laughs> all that founded in there but very very um imaginative and and a lot of fantasy and and uh creativity in rico's mind and i do wonder if this is going to come up at some point and we do definitely start to see kind of the that maybe you physically changing in the abyss is possible just through you mentally changing as well right and we do see that many things that happen in the abyss that kind of seem weird and against nature to us might be a result of an interplay between the mental landscape of the inhabitants of the abyss um and if if uh yeah if the physical outside world can influence your mind your mind can influence the physical outside world that that follows suit and it opens so many doors for interesting mysteries and interesting happenings and capabilities and and characters we could meet so there we go <laughs> another door unlocked another another question raised but just a few sprinkles of answers in between but that's that's been made in abyss uh made in abyss episode seven of the first season and we're already we're just seven episodes in and it's so fascinating i hope i'll see you on the next one um before you go please leave a like I would really appreciate it. Um, I would also appreciate if you subscribed, if you really like my um, Made in Abyss reactions. They're going to be coming out once a week or once every 10 days. Let, let me say it like that because I do have some, like, I do have to give myself some uh, buffer for university work and actual work and whatever comes along. Um, I do have a Patreon uh, if you feel like uh, looking at it. Um, I would appreciate if you. Um, took a look uh, see if there's something you like other than that uh, like I said I hope I see you in the next episode